Now, probably you're wondering why are there so many type of chemical reactors out there? And before we even get started with the answer, I just want to let you know that there are certain type of categories. We have laboratory reactors, we have pilot plant reactors, and we have industrial reactors. We want to know what are the industrial reactors, which type of processes, in which type of industries, what are the advantages, disadvantages, common operations, and so on. But just to let you know that there are much other type of reactors. Actually, you can encounter nuclear reactors and a lot of other type of reactors that are used for power generation and so on. But now let's actually get started with the question. Why are there so many type of chemical reactors? The very first one will be, and it kind of sounds cheesy, is that chemical reactions are unique. Depending on their nature, on what are they going to do, it's pretty similar to the way that uh, person A is going to encounter or interact with person B. You never know if it's going to be a very heated argument or maybe it's going to be a very passive argument. Sometimes it doesn't even happen. Sometimes they are very explosive. Sometimes it's very slow jet happening. Now let's get more technical. They may be exothermic in nature, endothermic. They may be in equilibrium. They may form subsequent reactions. They may form different type of phases. Maybe they're started in liquid and they ended up in gas. So there are many things that we're talking about when we're making the argument on why do we have so many types of chemical reactors? Because every chemical reaction is unique in their nature. Of course, this doesn't mean that we need a chemical reactor for every single type of chemical reaction, but you will see that depending on the nature of reactions, you may fit certain type of chemical reactors. Now, the context depends a lot in the type of products and or industry. If we're talking about uh, petrochemicals or oil and gas, we're going to encounter a lot of recovery of certain type of materials. Maybe we're going to encounter a mild polymerization or addition reaction. In the case that we want to form gasoline from small molecules, but also the reverse is true. We may have very large molecules and we want to break them up. Hence, we use crackers. Crackers is nothing more than a reactor is going to use catalyst and heat and pressure to break up those molecules in order to form more gasoline. But if we're talking about pharmaceuticals, maybe we want to focus our attention in having a very specific selectivity because we don't want to encounter other type of materials. Hence, we may use a batch reactor, which we know that we can uh, modify the time of cycle in order to improve the final product specification. So there's a lot of ways in which a chemical or industry context may affect the chemical reactor selection. Sometimes mass transfer, heat transfer operations may be prioritized, meaning that, okay, we have the full control of the reactor, but we know that later on it's going to get complicated when we separate certain type of materials. Or maybe we already know that if we were able to achieve very, very high temperatures, we will be able to achieve the maximum yield or productivity of our reactor, but Technically speaking, it's not feasible or for sure, whenever talking about safety and hazards, it doesn't make quite much of a sense to operate at high temperatures. As stated before, gas formation, liquid formation, the disappearance of a certain phase or formation of solids, crystals and so on may affect the reactor selection for sure, guys. So definitely this is something important to consider. Another question that arises is, are we going to be using a catalyst? And how is this catalyst going to be placed? Or how is this catalyst going to interact between the reactants and products? And how are we going to recover that catalyst? So for sure, this is a topic that must be considered and it's going to affect the final reactor type. Sometimes, due to the nature of reactants or the final products, we're going to encounter that the mechanisms or the pathways of reaction are very complicated and eventually what you will see is that certain type of reactors will favor certain type of pathways and other type of reactors are not going to favor such. So depending on the type of product or selectivity or essentially the profitability of the process, you may prefer other type of reactors over other types. We cover already a little bit on the high temperature, but sometimes thermodynamics and kinetics will not simply allow certain type of reactions. If we want to operate at certain type of temperatures, very low, very high, or maybe very mild, 
this may not be the case. Hence, we may select one type of reactor over other type of reactor. And that's why we have a lot of type of reactors. We need to have certain type of reactors for certain type of operations or certain type of reactions, certain type of thermodynamic pathways and so on. Moral of the story is that essentially what we want to do is to favor high yield product formation while maintaining the technical feasibility of the process as well as profitability. So we need to start thinking more on the profitability or does it make sense to operate at very high temperatures? Is it environmental friendly? Is it going to help for the safety? Or are we going to reduce hazards? Or are we going to improve the conversion rates? So all of these questions are things that a chemical reactor engineer needs to have always going on in their head. So back to technical feasibility. The reaction must be technically feasible, let it be that thermodynamically and kinetically it actually happens. So in book, let it be it could happen, or let's say in theory it could happen. There must be no hazards, no safe concerns. It must also account for human labor and error. We always need to consider this and finally the environmental considerations. So this is a quick summary on the technical feasibilities that we need to always to consider. Is it actually technical possibly? Or are we talking about that maybe thermodynamically it's simply impossible, so why try to achieve certain type of reactions that simply numbers don't add up? Or maybe we're talking about kinetics. Is kinetics helping us? Or also the other hand of the coin, are we going to make it safe? Is it going to be more hazardous? Well, that's also something to consider. Must account for human labor for sure, but human error is also very important. And environmental issues. On the other hand, it may be technically feasible and makes sense, but if profitability doesn't make that much of a sense, we're talking about maybe that the product must have an added value. Sometimes a chemical reaction doesn't have a final added value. A good example will be burning fuels. We don't have that much of a value for carbon dioxide and water vapor, but for gasoline, we do have an added value. The product must be valued in the market. Sometimes you can produce a lot of valuable things, but if the market is not accepting such demand, well, it doesn't make that much of a sense to produce that material. The product must be competitive versus other alternative. In this specific case, if we are producing certain type of pharmaceutical, it must be at least cheaper, better, or more accepted in the public. If we are producing a material or a drug that may not be quite updated, it's actually the reverse, it's very outdated and it's very expensive and it's very hard to get to the customers. Well, what you will see is that it doesn't make that much sense to produce it. Reactors are chosen based on requirements imposed by the reaction mechanisms, and we already talked about that, rate expressions, the required production capacity, reaction heat or how much energy they are releasing or absorbing, the reaction rate constant, how quickly is the reaction occurring or how slowly, heat transfer coefficients, sometimes you need to be able to heat up or cool down something, but if the reactants are not following along the rhythm or the velocity or rate of heating, well, it may encounter a problem. Reactor sizing, something definitely quite worth checking out environmental, safety, and technical issues. An important factor in reactor operation is the outlet degree of conversion. How much of the material you're actually converting by the end of the reaction. So if you have a 95, 98, 99%, that may be high, but in some cases having a 10% conversion will be fine. Later on, we're going to cover that, but for now, just stick to this idea. The following operating conditions are related to the economic operation. Temperature is some aspect to consider. The higher temperature, you require different type of equipment that is definitely much more expensive. It's going to cost you way much more to operate at higher temperatures. You need to insulate the materials. It's also expensive. If we want to operate at certain type of pressures, either very low pressures or very high pressures, you need systems for that, vacuum systems or high pressure systems, materials, valves, all safety. Heat duty is something to consider as well. The degree of agitation, if you need to mix uh, very violently or very aggressively, or maybe you want to avoid the mixing, so you need to pour slowly the material. Degree of conversion, stated before, something to consider. Recycle and flow rates are something also worth checking out. The more you need to recycle, the more you need to pump, the more you need to mix, the more you need to heat or cool down. 
And finally guys, I just want to leave you with this card. The optimum reactor that will best meet the process requirements will typically require a review, extensive review of whether the process is continuous or patched. This is one of the most fundamental ones. Uh, selecting different type of operations that we're going to see later on, make no worries, is something to consider. Not only that, the issue may get complicated when there is a requirement or convenience to operate with a combination of reactor types or multiple reactors in series or parallel. So far, we were just talking about a single reactor, but sometimes, as I said before, we can have several types of reactors working towards a final goal. How crazy is that? And not only that, it could be in series, it could be in parallel, or in a mixture of series and parallel. So as you can already imagine, this is why we have a lot of types of chemical reactors. We have a lot of ways in which we can operate, a lot of ways of material handling or production. We have many types of industries, many types of customers. So that's why it's very hard to have just one type of reactor. We need to be able to fit the final product needs.